has the time to study the source code of all the programs that she uses and then personally write all the changes that she might want. This is beyond what any one human being can do. So the only way we can fully have control of our computing is to do it working together, cooperating. And for that, we need freedom three, the freedom to contribute to your community, the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions. That allows us to work together. Because suppose a few people develop a free program and release it, and we start using it, but it has a problem. Well, somebody can start with that version and implement part of the features we wrote. Well, suppose we want more features. We want it to do, we want it to be better. Well, somebody can start with that version, implement part of the features we want, and release his modified version. And then someone else can start with that and implement some more and release her modified version. And then some other people can start with that and implement the rest and release their modified version. And then we will say, oh great, now it does everything we want. Thank you for collaborating to add these features. So Freedom 3 is essential also. And even users that can't directly exercise Freedoms 1 and 3 because they don't know how to program can take advantage of them indirectly. Suppose you have a business and you use computers, but you don't know how to program. Most businesses use computers, but their business is not software development and they don't have programs. So, suppose you would like, you realize that if the program worked differently, it would be better for your business and you'd make more money. Well, it would be worth it to you to pay a programmer to implement those changes if the price is right. So, you can talk with a programmer, and if you come to agreement, then you will distribute an exact copy of the version you run to that programmer, exercising your freedom too. Then that programmer will study the source code and, and change it to implement the changes you asked for. And he exercises his freedom number one. Now, you are not a programmer, so you don't know how to exercise freedom number one, but you're paying him to exercise his freedom number one for you. And then when he's finished, he makes a copy of his modified version and distributes it to you. So he exercises his freedom three. And then, assuming it works, you pay him. And this is how an important part of the free software business works. So users that can't exercise freedoms one and three, because they don't know how, can indirectly take advantage of them. And all users get the benefit of the four freedoms. Every user can exercise freedom zero and freedom two. The freedom to run the program as you wish and distribute exact copies because these don't require programming. If you can use the program at all, you can take advantage of these freedoms. Freedoms one and three do entail programming. Freedom one, the freedom to study and change the source code, and freedom three, optionally, to distribute copies of your modified version. And the users that don't know how to program can't do this, so they can't directly exercise these freedoms. But when others, the programmers exercise these freedoms, and when they release their modified versions, all of us get to install them or not, as we wish. So we get the benefit of living in a society where everybody has these freedoms. And what the four freedoms together give us is democracy. <coughs> You see, a free program develops democratically under the control of its users. All the users are free to participate in society's decision about the future of the program, which is simply the sum total of all the individual decisions about what to do with the program.
By contrast, a proprietary program develops under the dictatorship of its developer. The developer has total power, and the program operates as a tool to impose his power on the users. So, with free software, we have individual freedom, social solidarity, and democracy. With proprietary software, we have the dictatorship of the developer who can then command, bully, and exploit the developers. Society should choose free software and should totally reject proprietary software. Proprietary software is an injustice. Our aim is to put an end to this injustice. Our aim is the liberation of cyberspace and all of its inhabitants. I launched the free software movement in 1983. I had come to the conclusion that I wanted to use computers and have freedom. But that was impossible. It was impossible because the computer won't run or do anything useful without an operating system. And all the operating systems at that time for modern computers were proprietary. So if you bought a new computer, such as a PC, in order to make it do anything, you had to get a proprietary operating system, and there goes your freedom. So I was an operating system developer, and I realized I could change this. All I had to do was write another operating system, and then I, being the author, could legally make it free. And then everybody would be able to use computers and have freedom using my system that I would, I would write. So I was aware of an important social problem that affected a small fraction of society at that time, but I could see it was going to be more and more. And most people did not recognize it as a problem. I had the skills necessary to try to correct this problem, and it looked like nobody would do it if not me. That meant I had been elected by circumstances to do this work. It was my duty as a citizen. It's as if you see somebody drowning, and you know how to swim, and there's no one else around, and it's not Bush. <laughs> or Il Duchino, <laughs> then you have a moral duty to save that person. Well, I may have made a too strong a statement. It could be that there are some other people about whom I should not make the claim that you have a duty to re rescue them. People like Veronica. <laughs> But be that as it may, none of that affects me because I don't know how to speak. However, I do know how to develop software, or at least I did. So, and that was the job that needed doing. So I decided I would develop a free software operating system or die trying. Of old age, that is. Because at the time, the free software movement had no active enemies. Lots of people thought it was silly, but they just laughed for a moment and paid no more attention. So the obstacle was not opposition. It was a big pile of programs we would have to develop to have a complete free operating system. A lot of work. A discouragingly large amount of work. Lots of people who liked the idea were inclined to give up without trying because it seemed like so much work. Well, I said, uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's a lot of work, but we need freedom, so I have to try. So I decided to develop a free software operating system. I decided to recruit others to help so as to finish it sooner. I decided to uh, <clears throat> to follow the design of Unix to make a portable system, one that can run on various different kinds of computers, because I didn't know how computers would be 
different in five or ten years. And I wanted to write a system that would still be in use in five, ten, and more years. And then I decided to use the same commands as use to make the system upward compatible so that all the people who were already using Unix would find it easy to switch. And then I gave it the name GNU, which is a joke. You see, GNU is a recursive acronym. It stands for GNU's Not Unix. And this is a way of giving credit to Unix for the technical ideas that we got from Unix. But it also expresses the most important thing about the system. It's not Unix, because Unix is proprietary software. There was no way I could make Unix free software. In order for a system to be free, it had to not be Unix. So the most important thing about this system is that it's not Unix. But you can use it the same way as you can use Unix, which is nice. So, <clears throat> the word GNU also happens to be the most humor-charged word in the English language, used for a tremendous number of word plays. And the reason is, according to the dictionary, the G is silent, and it's pronounced GNU. So every time you want to write the word GNU, you can spell it G-N-U, and you've got a joke. Perhaps not a very good joke, but there are a lot of them. <coughs> However, in English at least, you have to be very careful not to call it the new system, because you get people confused. We've been working on it for 25 years now, and we've been using it for 17 years, so it's not new anymore. But it still is GNU, and it will always be GNU, despite the many people that mistakenly pronounce it Linux. But as you've heard, Linux is just one component in the system. During the 1980s, we in the GNU project developed many components aiming for our goal to have a complete free operating system. In 1992, only one component was missing. That was the kernel, which is the component at the bottom of the stack. That's the component that allocates the machine's resources to all the other programs that you run. Well, we were working on developing the kernel, but our project just hasn't succeeded. It's sad, but it was not a disaster because in 1992, another free kernel became available. That program was called Linux. And it was written in 1991 and first released in 1991, but then it was not free software. At that time, Linux was released under a license that was too restrictive. The license did not permit commercial redistribution. And that meant a large class of possible users were denied freedoms two and three. And, well, you can't do that, not free software. But, in 1992, Torvalds, the author, changed the license of Linux, and he released it under the GNU GPL, or GNU General Public License, to use the full name. And the GNU GPL was one of several free software licenses. So the crucial consequence is when Linux was available under the GNU GPL, it became free. So the combination of the almost complete GNU system and the kernel Linux was a complete free operating system. The first one since a decade or more before. It was the first free operating system that could run on any computer designed since the 1980s, since the beginning of the 80s. The first that could run on a PC, for instance. And thus, about eight 
were nine years after I had announced this goal, the goal was achieved. And the freeing of Linux to kernel was the last step, the step that carried us across the finish line. But a lot of people got confused, and they thought that the whole system was Linux. And they thought that Mr. Torvalds had developed the whole thing in 1991. The fact that most of it was already there, and we had built it and put it together with the goal of making a complete free operating system starting in 1984, they just ignored that. They didn't know that. So they thought it all came from Mr. Torvalds, and so they admired him tremendously, and they tended to follow his ideas of ethics and politics. And that is very unfortunate because of what his ideas are. You see, he has always rejected our ideas that freedom and social solidarity are the important values. He has different values, the values of an engineer. He wants powerful, reliable software, and that's all he says he wants. And when we say that the users deserve freedom, he says, no, that's, that's wrong. It's, he disagrees. Well, he has a right to his views, but it's not fair that the tremendous work that we did for the sake of users' freedom is being attributed incorrectly to him and giving him a bigger platform to argue against users' freedom. And that's really foolish and really harmful for society. Because when people think that Torvalds did it all, they tend to imitate his ideas too, and that means they don't even value their own freedom. And they're ready to give away their freedom and lose it for mere convenience. So, in the 1990s, as the GNU plus Linux operating system got more and more users and more and more contributors, there was a split within the community between those of us who said the goal is freedom. We are developing these programs so we can live in freedom, make freedom the goal, do what's needed to win freedom for us and for everyone. And then there were the others who said, uh, we just want powerful, reliable software. And in 1998, that second group coined another term. They didn't want to say free software anymore. So they coined another term, open source. And that term is connected with their political ideas. Their politics is the politics of being apolitical. 